Well, the long drawn out conservative leadership race is getting closer to a finish. Still almost two months to go, but it's time to take the insiders look at what's going on, what should be going on and what just might happen. Kathleen and David are here at the table tonight and in Ottawa, conservative insider Tim Powers is filling in for Jamie, who's under the weather today. So let's get right at it. First with a reminder of who's in the race. Look at this picture. A special prize for anyone who can name <laughs> all of these 14 people without looking at the names under their pictures. It's still a pack race. We keep expecting it's going to drop down, but it hasn't. All 14 still in at this moment. And when is the actual convention? May 27th uh, of this year in Toronto. And it's a ranked ballot system. So what does that mean? And uh, how different is it to... Uh, what we're more commonly used to. Tim, uh, you're the uh, conservative back rumor on this. Uh, tell us about the ranked ballot system. Well, it's actually the same system that was used in 2004. The difference in 2004 when Stephen Harper was elected leader, there were only three, Peter. Now we have four <laughs> times that plus two, uh, although much less exciting than 2004. The interesting thing about this system is perhaps less the rank ballots than the points allocation. Um, there are 100 points afforded for all 338 ridings across the country. To win, you have to get 16,901 points. So when you hear all these numbers coming about, out about people signing up 35, 40,000 members, that may sound great, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're ahead because what matters is how those memberships are disseminated across the country. And I'll give you one quick example. In the riding of Labrador, my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, there are less than 15 members. In Stephen Harper's riding, or formerly Stephen Harper's riding of Calgary Heritage, there'd be over a thousand. So you figure out the math. You've signed one in Labrador and 20 in Calgary Heritage. You're more likely to have the ability to get points in Labrador than you are in Calgary Heritage. Confused? So am I. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely <laughs> right. We're, mm. we're confused. But what's the? Is there an advantage or a disadvantage to going into the ranked ballot system, Catherine? Well, I think the thing is, like Tim's explained it, the numbers are confusing. It's very difficult. I think it's easier from a party administration point of view, but I think we still, journalists, pundits, the public, still think of delegated conventions, even though they haven't happened for quite a long time. Most parties have relegated them to the past. I mean, we've seen the famous stories of Joe Clark in the 70s coming up the middle when mm -hmm. people kind of moved towards him, or the Judy LaMarche famous story, or even as recently in 2006 when we saw Bob Ray and Michael Ignatieff not being able to agree and then... Dion, Stéphane Dion coming up the middle to be leader. Um, that's not going to happen anymore, but we still talk like they're delegated conventions. Mm -hmm. We still talk about these 14 candidates somehow trading, uh, you know, memberships and somehow Lisa Raitt by currying favour in some ways to Andrew Saxon by saying that he is sec second, her second choice, that somehow maybe Saxton voters will come over to her. Um, but in this rank ballot scenario, that's not necessarily always going to be the case. So let me get it straight. All the voting, such as it is, has taken place before the day. It's all in there. It's all on the computers. It's just a question of kicking into second choices, third choices. No, you when? can vote on the day. You can yeah. actually vote on the day as you well. You can vote on the yeah, day? as well. You can vote on the day. There are nine or ten in-person polling stations across the country, including one, I believe, at the uh, main event centre in but Toronto. But you could have done it before as well. In fact, you, you can do You have a month to vote. You right. can vote between April 28th and May 27th. <laughs> yeah, the ballots are going out in about 30 days from now. On April 28th, they start getting mailed out to people, and right. they can start voting right away in the first week of May. All right, David, does it, does it play to anyone's advantage? advantage in the scenario that we're looking at now those those 14 I think it probably plays to the front runners advantage because there are understood to be sort of three people who have more support on the first ballot than anybody else is likely to have uh, and they're but they're all what I would call weak front runners like they're all coming in at 20 percent of the vote 22 percent of the vote kind of thing as opposed mm -hmm. to a front runner that has 40 percent of the vote normally the worst place to be in in a convention is a weak front runner position because everybody's going to gang up on you and you're not close enough to the top to creep over. Whereas this, by as, as Kathleen has explained, eliminating the convention dynamic eliminates that gang up atmosphere against the front runner and gives these one of these relatively what I would call weak front runners still the most likely chance of winning. Mm -hmm. All right. um, 
what do we believe about endorsements? How important are they? Well, I actually might take a contrary point of view. Um, some people have talked about this conservative race that ah, endorsements don't matter, that's old school. Um, and because of the nature, as Tim described, the 100 votes per riding, it doesn't matter. But I actually don't think that's true. I think that if you use your endorsements well, some, uh, I know Shear has a number, but Aaron O'Toole has 26 uh, caucus members who've endorsed him currently. That means he has 26 MPs across the country working in those ridings that have 100 votes that he can help call the voters, he can use earned media, he can do radio shows, he can help facilitate tour. That's going to be helpful uh, to his campaign overall. And one thing that's not uh, that's interesting that I haven't seen done before in um, in this kind of leadership vote is when if you want to mail in your ballot for the conservative leadership, you fill it out, but you also have to have a photocopy of your driver's license right. and mail it in. And so having an MP in your riding where you can go and photocopy your, your driver's license and that MP is going to call you to remind you to vote is going to ensure better get out the vote kind of campaign activity. All right. What about membership numbers and money raised? How important is that when you hear those numbers? You kind of referred to it, Tim, a little, a little while ago, but how important is it? Well, here's the fact. You go back to the last race that was run under this system, which was 2004. So this is the second one. In that race, there were 250,000 plus members. Only 99,000 or so voted. So just over a third voted. So that's what people need to look at, the pattern. And the people who tend to vote, Peter, tend to be those who've been long-term party members. New people who've signed up, at least in the conservative experience, don't tend to be as committed to voting as they do. But for me, the key point is if you get to see how the votes or the memberships are spread out. For example, Kevin O'Leary says he signed up 35,000 members or thereabouts. If they're all members in Toronto, that's not as powerful as those 35,000 members being all across the country or Michael Chong 17 being spread out in Ontario and Quebec. So it's really hard to tell because you don't necessarily know where the membership sign-ups are, uh, are accounted for. David, how do you turn membership votes into or membership sales into votes? Well, it's uh, it's a lot of organization. It's a mm -hmm. it's a massive exercise because, as as Tim said, you really have to pay attention to the quality of the memberships, not the quantity of the membership so much. And when you do sort of the mass signups of new people, the rule of thumb is if you get twenty to twenty five percent of those people out, you've done really yeah, really exactly. well. Mm -hmm. um, whereas so, uh, no, new, new members don't necessarily end up voting. They may not even know they're new members. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we did so, see that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they're, uh, no, they're, their commitment is pretty peripheral. And so, no, you're going to have to literally do what you would do on Election Day. Uh, to get those people out to vote, which is you're going to have to go to their house, you're going to have to phone them repeatedly, you may have to offer to babysit their kid, um, <laughs> and uh, because they, you know, they're not, you signed them up, they did a favor to you, it wasn't really something that they were terribly interested in doing, so you're going to have to force them to get out and vote, and I think Tim's making the terribly compelling point about the distribution of these things, mm -hmm. and so, you know, you would be well advised to focus on the worst conservative ridings in the country. And that's what's happening. Where you only mm -hmm. have to flip a few people. Um, as opposed to, frankly, this is where the MPs are a little less useful because they're they in ridings in... where lots of members exist, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Whereas you really need contacts in, uh, you know, uh, downtown Montreal. Um, where there's or in all of the Atlantic provinces mm -hmm. where currently the Conservatives right. have no mm -hmm. MPs, mm -hmm. right? right? So that's... I've mm -hmm. only got a minute left. Give me your number one tip for each of these candidates as they head into the final stretch of two months. Tim. Uh, work it. Go into all those communities and as David said, target the, the ridings where there aren't a lot of members. You'll have a better chance because they'll respect the fact you went there. Kathleen. There's just over 50 days left and about 30 until they start can start voting. So it's all about persuasion. So right now the candidates are faced with a choice. The campaigns are faced with a choice. Do we go hard? Do we start slugging and hitting some of our opponents to get earned media? Or do we um, you know, be kind and try to solicit their voters over? So that's the decision that they're going to be wrestling with it and they have to make it well because there is a tier in the middle a second tier of candidates there are the more moderate candidates and they're the ones that are hoping to make it a, a go for it for uh, the top position you got the final word David 
uh, craft a figure out where the winning coalition for you is and craft a message that will be broad enough to do that. Somebody's going to try to come from either 30 to 40 points behind 50 mm percent -hmm. to try to get to 50 percent. They're going to need a lot of other people's uh, supporters to mm -hmm. ultimately choose them on the second, third or fourth rank on their ballot. And so you need to think no matter which candidate you are, what do I have to do to my message that's going to make it work for the other candidate supporters? Is this wide open still? Well, not wide open, but is it open? We don't have the data. We don't have the data. Anyone who says they have the polling data, it's just not true because yeah. of the nature of how um, the contest is being held out. The other thing we haven't talked about tonight is that this is a party that is still stitched together. While liberals are liberals, New Democrats are generally New Democrats, this party, the Conservative Party, is still reform and, uh, and progressive conservative. And so paying attention to nurturing that to the, the next leader will have to do that. Otherwise, there could be major divisions. Thank you all. That was good, <laughs> Kathleen. David? And Tim, always great to have you with us. Thanks for joining. Thank you.